Welcome to the UkaCast, where two people from the UK discuss Asian cinema, yaoi manga, and queer media in general. It works like a book club. We announce what we're reading, and then a month later, we discuss it. And today's topic is After School Nightmare by Satona Mizushiro. We'll warn when spoilers are about to happening, so if you've not read the manga before and are interested, listen up and we'll tell you what it's all about. As usual, your hosts are Zoe from Let Zoe Spoil You, and MX Harry, me, from Dragon Hide Studios. And whether you've read or seen what we discussed today or not, feel free to help us continue the discussion in the comments below. Speaking of weird premises, oh segue, God. Yeah, there uh, we go. Today, our, our book of discussion is After School Nightmare. Would you say it's weird in its premise? I would say it was definitely weird in its premise. <laughs> ah, but I love it so much. I'm so glad I got to recommend it to you. So, um, I think let's start at the beginning and then move into spoiler territory. So, yeah. having been the reader rather than the, the one who already loved it, uh, how would you describe this... Uh, this manga this well for a start it was very different from what i was expecting to get recommended um <laughs> what were you expecting to i felt this when you recommended mw though i was like we're probably gonna start with something light and yaoi in school it's like no nope, not at all <laughs> now we've got terrorism and what? now we've got what? like i don't oh, know God. after school nightmare mm-hmm. i just i just thought that maybe they were going to get trapped in the school and someone was trying to kill them and they'd be gay <laughs> I don't know. That's a very... That's the yaoi premise I've seen a few times, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, like, compared to, like, there's a lot of, like, oh, no, we're trapped in the school. And I, I just basically, in my head, I had corpse party, but more yaoi. I was just thinking, uh, how was it? Jikai Gakuen Masquerade Sodomu, which is a far too long a title, but that's a PL game. Uh, uh, but yeah, those are premises that exist. There we go. Uh, See, so I thought so it would what... be that. This was more... This was more about identity than it was... Like than than I thought it would be. It was more. It was basically like, yeah, a story of kind of identity mixed with horror elements that represented insecurity and like mm. trauma and past experiences. Yeah, it's a really interesting blend. There's there's an element of fight of the week with the with the setup. There's some elements of yaoi with the romantic stuff and with the kind of you know feelings and and then there's also some major horror elements yeah because it's yeah. a lot about yeah i mean i and love then... the major horror elements because mm-hmm. i'm a horror nut so and i like those kind of like fight for survival like i call them game of death like oh, mangas yeah. and animes so i'm a big fan of like oh my goodness there's a conspiracy one of these people is not like the other <laughs> and like basically the entire backlist of um uh, Tonogai, the guy who does things like doubt and secret and judge ah. and which i all love but so it was kind of like oh this is kind of like a game of death with actual like real horror but with very much like jose romance going on yeah it, this is why i find it so interesting because it doesn't feel like it's uh, a kind of hackneyed um it's like most shoujo, shoujo anime, but with lasers, or school clubs, or cakes, or something like yeah. that. It doesn't feel like replace usual thing with another thing for your gimmick. It felt like actual writing had gone on. Yeah, Despite there was... the fact that it was very much a pastiche of the anime and manga tropes. And, oh, and the places where it just goes like, hey, we're using a trope. Fooled you! <laughs> and it's like, I'm here to diss the heck out of this trope in a very Frozen-esque style. I, I was I was very fond of those moments. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, no, no, for, those who have, for those who have not yet read After School Nightmare, it's ten volumes long. I'm sorry I sent you such a long one, but after <laughs> MW, actually... I was like, I could get away with a bit of length. Yeah, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a quick. It one. reads very quickly. I find that once you're in it, it's not like it's. It just kept kind of like going like so it wasn't a difficult read i wasn't like slogging through it i was like oh how have i read four issues today yeah and a lot like mw there's a lot there's a lot of i have no idea what's going to happen with these elements of these characters next yeah. i want to know and yeah with mw I, hel- I read it in big hungry chunks because of that uh yeah it was it was very compelling for me as well just a, a page turner as they say but that's implying that there's any other way to read a book yeah, well, no, sometimes you can struggle with something. I've, I've read, like, manga, and I'm like, this is interesting, but it's a bit heavy. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I'm a bit like, you know, I was like, oh, I'm not sure I like where this storyline is going. Maybe I'll read something else and come back to it. This one was like, no, I just need to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like, I'm currently reading a, 
a friend's partner's master thesis on trans masculinity and gender identity. And Ooh. it's utterly fascinating, but it's hundreds of pages long, and I can only really do ten at a time at a <laughs> push. It's just so wordy and interesting and long and thesis-like. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who's wrote a couple of those things and got people to check them, I can imagine it being less fun the other end when you're going, Ooh, this is very interesting, but... And also all the theories. So once you start going, and the semiotics, and the other person going, I don't know what you're talking about anymore. He's, he's, they're very good at explaining the words they're using. However, this just adds more to the word counts. <laughs> I occasionally feel like there should have been like some drawings or a diagram just to break it up a little. Because after a while, it's like, how many pages am I in? I feel like <laughs> I've read 100. Page 12. Oh, <laughs> I have no concept of length anymore. <laughs> oh, but yeah, sorry. Tangenting once more. That's what we do. We're yeah. used to it now, hopefully. Um, this this one was very compelling, hungry reading. I just kept going and going and going when I first discovered yeah. it. Uh, I was on a I say I was on an, a kick about this kind of oeuvre. However, there's only really two manga I've ever read that deal with the kind of the central uh, identity thing of After School Nightmare. What the other one is? Is um, yeah. Okay. Basic premise for people. Uh, it's following a character who is of ambiguous gender, uh, who is dealing with being intersex, has both male and female uh, parts, and is at f at, at first I'm, tr I'm trying to remember. It's been so long now. Were they at first presenting solidly male, and then going to try female? Yeah, it was. Yeah, presented male, and more than anything, wanted to be male, wanted to be identified as male. Mm -hmm. And then kind of starts coming to terms with what actually to be male means is not quite what they thought be male was. Yeah, they were they were approaching the gender from a a complete kind of denialist standpoint, and then the the mysterious school counselor appears and invites uh, them to these collective dream sessions to explore their issues. Uh, and they begin to explore relationships with other people which they haven't really done before and discover more about themselves and what they want to present as and what they like presenting as. Because in this dream state, they are completely presented as female. And at first are, first are very much understandably like, what the hell guys, what is <laughs> happening? This is not what I asked for. Who did this? How do I get out of here? And then they discover it is, yes, a game of death where basically people fight each other to the death for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and they have to go along with that, discover that they each have a unique weapon. Because it's yeah. not a manga, but it's actually a really interesting one because sometimes the weapons really aren't useful. Um, no. <laughs> and I love that. Um, it was a very extreme dream therapy mm. that kind of had that, like, you will graduate. So the winner of these kind of battle royales with dream versions of their powers and dream versions of what they want to be mm -hmm. trying to kill each other to find like there was plenty of the keys within them to yes, exactly. unlock the next level but even then like i was a bit unsure about whether or not they should be going through that door in the first place yeah exactly i love how vague and how little you know about it uh going into it it is and how you slowly begin to unravel the, the secrets of it all potentially before it tells you in certain cases like were there any well, did you get any points where you're like I guessed this thing correctly yes because um, I, I struggled I love a good mystery but I'm so bad at them <laughs> I I had moments when I was really convinced of things and then mm. I was like no no I'm totally like doubting I have to say the very very final like twist when you find out all of it I got it but not but I didn't get it t like halfway through. It was like towards the end. I was like, I started piecing things together. Ah. And so there were two things that I kind of worked out towards the end. So when I was going through the very last volume, I was like, now this is beginning to make sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I love the ending as well. Yeah. Just so high concept in the end. And it all makes it very human and heavily metaphorical and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Had, it. it had some, I mean... There's, there's really random things about it that I absolutely adored that I remember, I've got to get this out now because I remember the whole way through it going, I really love the way the flowers were placed. 
Mm. Like, I don't know why. I was obsessed with them. They had these amazingly, like, they always just, like, the way they overflowed onto, like, the pages and they framed mm. things. And it's like, I read a lot of Joe Say and stuff, and which it's normally like, this person is pretty. Look at all the flowers. But this was kind of like, there is some femininity here. So here is a lily. <laughs> and because we're not sure about the gender, this could represent lesbianism, but it might not. It might just be that this person is very slender. So look at this beautiful stem. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I like this. I like this. Mm-hmm. It's not like, here are flowers. Here are flowers. This is shoujo. There's romance. There are flowers. It's like, I like this. This is not like, you know, mm-hmm. attacking me. And then some of the other elements they use as kind of like metaphors and imagery remind me of things like Utena, where mm-hmm. it's more like, staircases and bird cages and just those kind of elements of like design work and doorways that just reminded me of some of the architecture from like the school in Utena. Mm-hmm. So from like actual design works, those were some of the bits that I was like, you know what, this is nice seeing something that wasn't just kind of using all the like usual like shoujo imagery, but kind of being a bit more subtle with it. Mm-hmm. And then the fact that there was horror in the middle of it, I was like, oh my goodness, that arm, that those oh, arms. God. That oh. thing creeped me out. And I'm like, who? Who are you, arm? Who? Oh, God, yeah. Arm in the mouth. That was no. That was big no for me. <laughs> that was, yeah, There's... a faceless girl. And it's oh, like... God, yeah. So everyone has, a, everyone has a form in the collected dream and a weapon. And the main character has the form of them as a girl, which they don't enjoy, and a feather sword. Yeah. Which isn't as useful as video games make you think. Uh... And they are suddenly paired off against all these characters that they've never met before and then they meet outside of the dream and try to discover more about them and what do these forms metaphorically represent to them. Uh, And there's a deranged looking horror ring-esque victim girl who throws umbrellas at people and pierces them to death. A faceless girl who... what was her ability? I can't remember. Um... She... Did, did she actually fight at all or did she just kind of hang around no she just kind of like drifted off she could um because she dragged the woman's arm through her and started like devouring so she wanted to literally oh. cannibalize other people to take on their personalities because she'd lost her own identity that's it and that's why she had no face yeah so she was trying to, yeah mm-hmm. cannibalize the other people in the dream exactly there's someone who was just two incredibly long pairs of arms ah yeah that was that was pretty creepy uh a seemingly a haunted suit of body armor a witch there was a lot going on and a giraffe. It was... oh yeah and the giraffe <laughs> i was like when he was like what the fuck who are you <laughs> this is giraffe like everything else has been like really kind of horror elements and then it's like yeah i'm a giraffe and i was like hmm but i loved i loved what the giraffe represented i love like oh my goodness yeah that totally makes sense that you mm-hmm. a giraffe oh yeah yeah but Oh. Yeah, it was just it's like, oh my goodness, this, this is so different. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, getting into spoiler territory now, but if you find this weird and interesting, definitely go read it. I found it really damn good and so different to a lot of the manga that you find these days. Uh, would you would you also recommend? Yes, definitely. It's it's just not like all the other stuff that's being like published and put out there. It's like this is different. It's it's mm-hmm. actually original and it's got quite a high concept and it deals with things that. Not a lot of them deal with or talk mm-hmm. about, which is nice. Oh, definitely. Okay, so, spoiler territory, spoilers from here, warning, warning, warning. <laughs> Let's talk a bit more about what happens further into it. Yeah, sorry, from from the form thing, and someone who was literally just a phone. Oh, that, <laughs> the, oh, the, the poor thing? bloke! I loved him. Yeah. I was just like, oh, I went in so many circles in this thing on, like, mm-hmm. who should end up with who, and who mm-hmm. I liked and didn't like. Um... I'm awful with names, but Umbrella Girl, mm-hmm. I went through whole phases of going, oh my goodness, I feel so sorry for you, I really like you, to going, I don't like you anymore. I really fell out of love with her, and mm-hmm. then I felt better for her. And then yes. I was just like, some of these pairings and like, and Phone Guy, I was just like, oh, he deserved more. Oh, poor Phone Guy, I know. And yeah, his... He... Because he wanted to connect with people. Yeah. He turned into a phone. And it's, it's oh. Like, oh. Yeah, the, the the main three characters, if there are three main ones mm. being the protagonist and their two potential romantic interests, they are all so good points and bad points, layered, and yeah. they have their issues. Like They all make some pretty bad choices and get angry, and 
I, I love the moment where he's kind of been with both of them and they, they hang out on the roof and each lunch together and it's like the rejected romances of this character yeah. club. <laughs> and I'm like, yes! This, I, this is... Uh, I yeah, did this like the that. whole kind of, oh, in this game you can be with anybody. It's not like they have feelings. Uh, <laughs> it, I felt like those romances that happened then didn't really happen and uh, were based entirely upon very fl ultimately quite fleeting feelings or misunderstood feelings yeah were so much more real than so many of the relationships we get in lamer kind of by the numbers yeah Mandarin the ones where Yowie. they just kind of go this person this person met therefore romance and you're like well i don't know like they need to have a little bit more of a connection than that and also they're not they shouldn't be all that picture perfect from like the beginning <laughs> exactly like... i mean i i know that your current background is civil war have you seen it yet oh <laughs> god yeah Okay, minus but <laughs> minus spoiler for Civil War. Could could Steve have not made out with Peggy's great niece? That just felt really weird to me. Well, they, they get together in the comics, so that's, that's fine. But she's had so little screen time in the I movies know. that when she turned up and was like, "Hi, I just gave a speech at your ex girlfriend slash my great aunt's funeral." Yeah, you did. We should make out. Yeah, but her body's still slightly warm. Let's wait for later in the film and then do it awkwardly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then my bros will thumb me up because that's totally what this movie is. What? Yeah. It, it's, I felt yeah. so awkward about that. Partly because... Oh, God damn it. I, I know that I queer code people all the damn time. However, if anybody... If you had to have someone make out with Steve, if you literally had to <laughs> for legal reasons... Yeah. Surely it'd be Bucky. Yeah. Surely. It, yeah. Stucky isn't a thing. Mm. I mean, it wouldn't be a thing if everyone wasn't kind of going, yeah, no, that that that's that that's the thing. They're pairings. By the mm. time I believe it, when um OTPs actually have names for their couple fandoms, there's got to be enough evidence. So Stucky, mm. that's a real thing now. And it's like they totally like. I mean, they literally like you went to war for him. He's like, I'm going mm. to go like. And he's like, and protect him right to the end. And exactly. He just wants to protect his his poor broken old friend. Yeah. It's just like no one understands him. <laughs> I know. Like... I came out of that movie about eight different slash pairings, so I'm like not really <laughs> one to talk. I was like, oh yeah, those guys said two seconds Clearly of screen I time. Too. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I had everything going. I'm like, oh yeah, Ant Man's ridden on like Hawkeye's bow and arrow. Totally a pairing now. <laughs> I was just like, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, when when Ant Man turned out, that was so funny. I Civil, Civil War. I feel there's some great character dynamics, and then like Ultron, it goes into. But we have to have action in here. It's like, but guys, you were just hanging. You were trying to talk to each other like normal people. <laughs> that would have worked. Why Wait. do you have to punch each other so much? <laughs> I quite oh. like the punching, but then I like violence in my movies, so I'm okay. Uh, and that, nothing makes fair. men feel more love than when they're hitting each other so i quite quite like you know that, that's me i'm like oh no they're bleeding it's so beautiful and oh. i'm just like yeah but that, that must be that must be a hell of a lot of romance in after school nightmare then because there's a lot of punching <laughs> and stabbing yeah yeah i'm oh. like i'm that kind of girl yeah I mean, actually it's it, we were talking about persona earlier and there is that similar thing about having the real world in a high school and then the metaphored world with all the internal conflicts kind of allegorized and that's a really interesting approach. That's the thing I liked about Persona as well, is that all the other mangas where it's like, they have to be in a high school, because that's the that's our that, audience, and yeah. that way you get empathy. So everyone lives. But they spend, like, five minutes a month in the high school because, you know, they have to go save the world or something. I like it when they're in school and then their issues become the difficulty and the monsters and evils that they fight are based upon those issues, which is what, which is what Persona's about. It's about people fighting their inner demons uh the the id the ego the super ego comes up in it it's really interesting and yeah i found that as well the thing as a rule of thumb i i have like a bechdel test for anime and manga <laughs> and it's like if it's set in a high school if there is one girl who has massively inferior powers to everybody else or none yeah just just things like that then i'm not really that interested no if they're all of the age of consent but look like they're 12, no. No, then I'm definitely, I'm off that one. It's it's deterrence. It's so many things where it's like, you're making this because everybody else has made this before. Why? Why would you bother? This, this yeah. took so much money to make. It's like the, the trailer just came out for the horse girls uh, school thing. Oh, is that the, I know there's a manga about like, my high school sent our life. 
No, they're not centaurs. They're they're literally. You know how there's cat girls, which is literally ears and tail. Yeah. They're horse girls with slightly horsier ears, tail, and usually a ponytail as well. Okay. And the trailer's just them racing and swimming and doing athletics, and it's just all these girls who are young and high schoolery-ish. And my partner Mike just showed me it in sheer dumbstruck confusion at this thing existing. And I was just staring at it going like, why are there cat girls racing? I don't get it. And then the, the logo with a big fan the, service. Ho- Yay. horseshoe came into it. And I was like, oh, they're meant to be horses. They just look exactly the same. It's bad when the humans look exactly the same. It's worse when your subspecies of humans look exactly the same. Because everything's yeah. derivative. But yeah, it's anime that is samey. It, it There's like a, a real problem with anime and manga at the moment that I'm finding that everything is looking a little bit like the same some mm. of the originality especially some of the darker stuff mm-hmm. like just isn't and i'm trying to like the things that used to appeal to me i'm like i cannot find that 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 niche i like mm-hmm. and everything the moe invasion has definitely taken its toll on the anime scene because everything's looking oh. a bit too cute and a bit too here are all these people who are and it's and they play it safe and they never go like down the darker routes mm-hmm. and they don't do as much um genre hybridization as they used to like he used to get kind of cross as a genre, which is why like after school was great because I'm like mm-hmm. this is literally this is a horror manga. This is, mm-hmm. and the horror is their own insecurities, which is what horror is. You watch all the great horror films. Each mm-hmm. horror is the representation of insecurity in real life, and Japan used to be the best at that because mm-hmm. the ring was fear of modern technology, and phone was the fear of modern technology, and like mm-hmm. they were leading these great horrors. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I love this genre. Where's it gone? Mm-hmm. And then. Exactly. Well, it's like the the, the zombie uh, genre in the West is that zombies are best when they represent uh, something that we fear making us into zombies or taking over. When they first came out, racistly, it was about, you know, the othering of uh, different races. But they have over time uh, been about epidemics and about disease, about corporations with ridiculous tech just making super soldiers, about, you know, humans as expendable. Uh, about us getting disaffected with our modern lives in Dead Set. It's about so... They can be about anything. They are a slate on which you can... The reason that they become zombies and the the way they outbreak is always best when it's something about a struggle that people are actually facing. And it, it brings it brings that to light. It does a, it just through, a, through a glass darkly. It's And that's the most interesting thing. And yeah, the same with uh, J- Japanese horror. I mean... And the thing is, when, because the anime, because the genre is so flooded with sameness now, when you get something that does differentiate from it, people lose their minds in helping promote it. Hence why absolutely everyone is talking about Tokyo Ghoul. It's <laughs> everywhere yeah. now. But now it's too everywhere. Especially if you watch the second series, which is not very good. I'm sure anime fans will probably hate me for it, but I didn't like the second series. It got very boring and very samey and didn't go anywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> and I liked Parasite better. And I'm like, what? Oh, I haven't seen Parasite yet. It looks really good from the trailer. Oh, Parasite's great. The anime is is just, it's good. It's everything I wanted from Tokyo Ghoul, including a conclusion. And it's like, (laughs) oh my god, it had an ending. It had a full storyline. Oh my god, I love that. That never happens. I know, and everyone, I'm one of those people that gets like, if someone tells me to watch something too much, I go, I don't like it. If everybody starts telling me something is amazing, I go, I don't like it. So I kind of get a bit like, I don't, I want to find things for myself. So Mm. everyone started going, oh my god, isn't Tokyo Ghoul amazing? And I went, I liked it at first, but Mm. now, now, now actually, you know what, Parasite's better. And I start trying to look at other things that like, the other great one that, I'm reading the manga for it, is Arjun Demi-Human. And the manga is great. They just released the anime on Netflix, but they've chosen an awful art style. It's all like weird Aww. CG stills. Mm-hmm. It's like like Knights of Sidonia, but done even worse. And I'm like, this is... This does not feel like this wonderful, like, Arjun-like manga, which is about Demi-Humans who live amongst humanity. And there's all these different layers, like, are they being used as weapons? Are they a new species? Should they be wiped out? Should they be experimented on? And literally, kid, basically, it starts off, kid crosses road, gets hit by a bus, come, stands back up, and they go, ah, shit, well, you're not dead. You must be a Demi-Human. If I catch you, I will get this much reward. And he's like, shit off but, he goes yeah. right rum but they're demi-humans so they all have this weird being inside them that they can astro project that represents 
something. So at the moment, it's kind of like these weird mysteries. It's got, oh, if you look it up, the art style for the demi-humans, their actual projecting forms is just like... So I probably can grab my manga off the shelf. The artwork for these things, I'm going to shove them in your face for what these actual projecting uh, creatures look like. And it's just cool. like, it's something, it was different. And I'm just annoyed that the anime has been done in such an awful art style because I'm like, that's going to put people off. Oh, I think I've seen this, uh, some of these images shared around before. Yeah, people are talking about this one. Yeah, and I think it's one that should be talked about, especially since it's good old Vertical, and Vertical know how to publish something a little bit weird and non-mainstream. <laughs> so when everyone started going, oh my god, Tokyo go, I went, mm -hmm. oh, what's this, Arjun? Because I'm a bit like that. See, this is the thing. You can make great uh, manga that's mainstream, with an element of horror, in the case in point, one of the most stand the test of time uh, anime out there is Death Note. Oh god, yeah. You know, people will watch and kind of share Death Note, I think, pretty much forever. It's a staple. It's like One Piece or Dragon Ball. It's everywhere. Yeah. And you can do that. You can have a closed story arc. You can have characters die and it actually mean something. That's, that's another one of my issues that comics and manga both do. It's like, well, we could kill this person, but we kind of want to have another 200 volumes just to really bleed everything out of everybody. Could they maybe die and then not die? Just so we can get more money, because they like this character. They'll go to like, another dimension. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, if you kill them, you kill them. Have it mean something. This is why Torchwood is so heartbreaking. Oh, God, don't, don't go there. Uh, I know. I had such the ever... rage quit over that so. <laughs> Will it ever not be too soon? Oh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't cope well with that. And every time oh. I go to Cardiff, I always go down to the Yanto Shrine and pay my respects. There's a Yanto Shrine? Have you never been to the Yanto oh, Shrine? No, I have to Cardiff. Oh, my God. Oh, my living Lord. It's still there. It's still... <laughs> basically, the, the, yeah, when, the, when you go down to the bay, oh, my God, I do a pilgrimage every three years because I'm a Torchwood fanatic. Like, And basically, it's after he died, outside where the, the hub oh entrance God. is, it's yeah. flowers and pictures and memorials and cards, and they've just never... It's become a tourist attraction. They just never took any of it down. Six years on, and Yanto Shrine is still going. Wow. Yeah. I have never heard of this phenomenon. Yeah, Yanto Jones is one of the like most hard-hitting character deaths in television ever. I can't m think of any other character that died and has a shrine in the city where they filmed it, outside the place he supposedly worked. Well, see, compared to like the death of the Ponds, which I thought, I love the idea of how they died, but it just felt really weirdly sudden, being, oh, let's get them back for another half of a series and then kill them off in a really convoluted way. To the point where... Never... Not sure if they're dead or not, really. It was a bit like, are they just... Ex exactly, I was like, they're still alive, they're just, they can't leave Chicago? Even though they could, you know, or, or New York even, they could take a taxi and, and get out of that area and then visit. I'm so confused as to why this is their death. And then the, the, the plot was just like, no, they're dead! Get over it, they're dead! <laughs> Goodbye! For reasons! Because oh. they're expensive and they wanted to do other work! And it's like, yeah, and, and meanwhile, Yanta Jones... So sudden, but un understandably sudden, and you got it, and it hurt. Oh, I and, was. And he had to have such a complicated character as well, because it's like, there is some level of gay coding in there, but he himself doesn't identify as gay, it's just Jack. Yeah. And that makes him so interesting, because such... nobody normally does that. Yeah. Normally it's like complete erasure. You know, like, you see it in, oh, you see it in so many things where it's like, oh, I like this one person. It's not like I've ever liked anyone of the opposite gender, except for all those people before this point. They weren't real, they didn't count. <laughs> I didn't discuss that in all the previous volumes. I'm like, and now I'll stop reading Spinneret. Sorry. It's, uh, it's a thing. Yeah. I need to visit that shrine now, that's amazing. It is a magical <laughs> place. I'll see if there's any kind of Comic Cons I can go to. <laughs> there's not Probably quite a few one. of them. Hey! Awesome. They, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the Anti Shrine's a magical place, although oh. depressing place. But yes, uh, the threat of death and the threat of people vanishing is also a thing in After School Nightmare. 